Hello. Okay. Um, can you talk? I just want to do the sound mm -hmm. check. <laughs> All right. Spot I'm recording. Mm -hmm. So we'll get started now then, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. I know that um, we'll probably have more people join us as we get into it, but um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tania Hope. I am the director of the Ralph J. Bunch International Affairs Center here at Howard University. Thank you all for joining us for this, um, this conversation on race politics and the Russian invasion of U the Ukraine. Um, I am really excited for this conversation. Obviously, obviously a very timely conversation. And I'm really happy that we can participate in bringing to light some of the issues that I think maybe are not being covered in other in other spaces. Um, and and I, this is what we do at Howard University. So I'm grateful for my colleagues, uh, Dr. Amarillas Lugo de Fabritz uh, for bringing this idea um, to us uh, and, and uh, the other panelists for joining us. So I am going to uh, read some brief bios so that you all know that we are in the presence of real experts on the in, in the world on this. I, I've been watching, um, not watching, I've been following Kimberly on Twitter as I met her, it seems like last year, but it wasn't last year. It was like almost three years ago. But anyway, when she came here and I've been following her ever since and then just watching her blow up on Twitter as this happened, I was like, I know her. Um, and you were talking to the right person. So um, this is gonna be a great conversation. So. First of all, uh, we have uh, Dr. Heather Ashby, who's a foreign policy and national security expert here in Washington. She currently serves as senior program officer at the United States Institute of Peace in their Center for Russia and Europe. Before joining USIP, she worked at the intersection of Homeland Security and International Affairs and on US-Russia relations at the Department of Homeland Security. In 2014, she received her PhD from the University of Southern California with a focus on the relationship between the Soviet Union and people from Asia, Africa, and the Americas. She was named by New America as a Black American National Security and Foreign Policy Next Generation Leader in 2018, and she currently serves as a co-chair for the WCAP's Intersectionality of National Security Subworking Group. And she has published articles in Foreign Policy, Inkstick, and Project Syndicate. We love WCAPs over here. Um, next up, we have Kimberly St. Julian Varnon, who, whose work focuses on Russia, the Soviet Union, Central Asia, and East Germany. Currently, she is a PhD candidate in history at the University of Pennsylvania. She has a master's degree from the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University. Before her doctoral studies, she was a community college history professor and secondary teacher, and her public writing analyzes race, foreign policy, and culture in the United States, Russia, and Ukraine. Next, we have uh, Dr. Clarence Lusain, who is a full professor and former chairman of the Howard University Department of Political Science. Uh, he is an author, activist, scholar, lecturer, and journalist. For more than 40 years, he's written about and been active in national and international human rights, anti-racism politics, diaspora engagements, U.S. foreign policy, democracy building, and social justice issues such as education, criminal justice, and drug policy. He earned his BA in communications from Wayne State University and both his master's and PhD from Howard University in political science. As a scholar, researcher, policy advocate, and activist, he has traveled to over 70 nations and lectured on U.S. race relations and human rights in Brazil, Colombia, China, Cuba, Germany, Guyana, Guadalupe, lots of other countries, and the Ukraine. Um, so we are happy to have him. And then finally, uh, Dr. Amaryllis Luba de Fabritz, who is our master instructor for Russian at Howard University's Department of World Languages and Culture. She was born in Ponce, Puerto Rico, and she attended high school in Acton, Massachusetts, where she started her studies in Russian language. She received her bachelor degree in Russian language and literature with honors from Brown University. She received a Master's of Art in International Studies in Russian, East European, and Central Asian Studies from the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington in Seattle. And she completed her doctorate in Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Washington as well. 
And for those of you who do not know, <clears throat> Harvard University has been teaching Russian and Russian languages and culture uh, for 61 years. This is our 61st year um, having that program and we continue to be the only HBCU that offers that. Uh, and so we thought that for that reason and um, as the statement that we issued this morning on the situation states, the, the issues that are going on as people are trying to leave, people of African descent in particular are trying to leave the Ukraine. Uh, we thought that it was a, an important conversation that we as Howard University should be hosting um, at this intersection of race and politics and, and war in, in the Ukraine. So with that, each of, each of our panelists is going to speak for just a few minutes and offer some opening remarks, and then we will open up to Q&A. So I don't know who would like to go first. We didn't talk about that. Um. <laughs> um, we could go alphabetically. That would be that would be fine. Yes, Dr. So. Ashby. Sure. Uh, I think what's been challenging about Russia's war against Ukraine is that there are so many dynamics to it, and it's multifaceted. And so, what's often portrayed in the media is a very simplified version of it that says, "Oh, it's just about NATO expansion." but it's much larger than that and it has wider implications. And so just the work that I do at the US Institute of Peace, it's looking at those wider implications. And so what I in particular focus on, in addition to the work that we have uh, going on in Ukraine or did have going on in Ukraine is Russia's activities in the global South. And so what I'm gonna start with with my comments is just looking at those wider implications. And so beyond NATO expansion and just being a uh, conflict between so-called brotherly nations between Ukraine and Russia is a discussion right now that's happening within government and will continue to happen after this war somehow finds a resolution is what is the international system going to be? And that's going to be something that multiple people should participate in because one of the reasons we get to this point is that we have the same people at the table, the same type of thinking and the same type of people who duplicate themselves in government. So that's my shout out for people to consider jobs in the US government. So you're at the table during negotiations, during back channels to form partners. And if you need any assistance with that or guidance, I'll put my email address there so you can reach out to me and I'll help out however I can. And so what would what we need to consider is how do we make a more equitable international system where larger countries such as Russia doesn't feel like they could go around and bully other countries and have majority of the world sit by and not do anything like what happened in 2014 where you have some sanctions, but nothing that goes too far or 2008 where you have Russia's invasion in Georgia. And so it's important for all of us to start conceptualizing, even on the smallest of levels, to say, what type of future do I want to see for the international system? And for me, it's to go back to the non-aligned movement and that effort to push for a more equitable system, international institutions that could challenge a lot of these bigger countries that think that they could dominate, they could take advantage and they could exploit through businesses, through government activities, through security relationships. The other thing that I'm paying attention to is just the implications for the global south in particular for food security issues and paying attention to that in the Middle East and North Africa at the US Institute of Peace, our emphasis is on conflict. And so that's something to track in terms of how that could exasperate an already delicate situation in many countries uh, that are already vulnerable because of internal dynamics of conflicts between ethnicities, nationalities, religions, uh, in addition to looking back at what gave rise to the Arab Spring, a big trigger of that was food insecurity. Uh, the other aspect is Russia 
will not, after this war is over, not have the funds to engage in other malign activities on the level it was. So they're going to look for low cost ways to intervene in countries, to cause conflict, to exasperate conflict, and to put further pressure on the international system. And where they're going to look to do that is in the global south, particularly Africa, which is what I'm tracking with other members of my organization, Central Africa, West Africa, the Sahel, uh, East Africa, and that's in addition to what they have going on in Latin America with Venezuela, with Nicaragua. And so in terms of considering the importance of why we should focus on this conflict, it's that it has ramifications throughout the entire international system. And then I would close with one thing to, I'm not trying to be fatalistic before I start that, is that the idea of nuclear war or extremely powerful bombs may be back on the table for the international system. And it's to make sure that once again, we have people at the table to have those discussions and see ways that we could prevent the rise of another arms race. Because once you invest funds in arms race, then you don't have stuff for student loan forgiveness and other type of programs that can help people advance within society and provide support for different types of groups. And so that's another aspect of this conflict to monitor, not just in the short term, but the long term as well. So thank you for inviting me. This is great. And I look forward to all the questions and especially the comments from the other panelists. I'm going to go to Kimberly next. Um, yeah, I'm going to go to Kimberly next. Oh, so it's great to be following Dr. Ashby um, because she is an icon. And I did blow up overnight on Twitter and it's really weird. Maybe it's because I'm an elder millennial and I'm just still not used to this. Um, but my comments will focus on the, the role of race in this conflict, but also not just anti-Black racism, but we can talk about more global geographies of white supremacy and proximity to whiteness that impact Eastern Europe and, and what we're seeing in Eastern Europe. Um, give, I know many of you have seen the videos that um, have exploded on Twitter. I think they're on TikTok and, and Instagram now of African students at the border. You see people being pushed. You see people being verbally harassed. Um, it's about the same three videos actually that, that are kind of going around. And so what I hope to do is to contextualize this a little bit and to talk about um, like what we're seeing and why this isn't new. I mean, if we, if we look at the news in December, there was a, a migration crisis along the Belarus and, and Poland border in which Syrian refugees were being kept out of Poland and they weren't being allowed into Belarus. And so we saw many of the same images. So when we think about what's going on at the border, particularly between the Ukrainian and Polish border, um, Romania, the Romanian border has been a lot easier for African students to get through. One of the big things is there are just less people going to Romania. So the times are, you, takes less time and it seems easier for them to have diplomatic contacts in Romania than it is in Poland. So that's a big aspect of this. Um, but we also need to contextualize what we're seeing. And so like some of these videos are three days old. And so if you follow some of the, these students on Twitter, they're also talking about that they've transited through. They're in Poland or they are in Hungary. Um, and they've also talked about the help that they've received from Ukrainians who are helping them transit through and from Poles and Hungarians who are helping them once they're in country. And so I think that's why we really need to focus on the, the wider picture of what we're seeing from the border, but also to understand that there are thousands of African students, Indian students, Roma students, and African and Roma and Central Asian residents of Ukraine or Ukrainian citizens who still are in Ukraine. And there is a incoming humanitarian crisis that we're seeing. Um, and I know many of you are following the Africans in Ukraine um, hashtag. There's also like the Sage Sumi, Sumi students in Ukraine hashtag. I am in contact with a large contingent of international students in Sumi State University in northern Ukraine, which is surrounded by the Russian military right now. And I've also seen the tweets saying, oh, they need to get out. And so this is the problem. I'm going to explain this very clearly. There are those of us who are working with these students and trying to keep them safe. And that means they need to stay where they are because the Russian uh, the Russian troops are taking aim at civilians. They've already shot at a small group of students, international students who tried to leave Sumi, and we're working to get them food and water. Actually, a large contingent of them already have food and water. 
thanks to the contacts we've established on the ground. So while the videos that you're seeing on Twitter are horrific and they represent some of the worst cases of racism that many people have seen, trust those of us who work on Eastern Europe who are experts at this, who have contacts on the ground and who have up-to-date information because we're helping these students and a lot of these students are safe, especially those in Sumi. My contacts, you know, ethnic Ukrainians on the ground are, have gotten them food and water, are contacting them and have contacted the embassies for them. So when I speak about racism on the border, when I speak about racism against Africans and other, you know, brown and black people in Ukraine, one, I've experienced it myself in Ukraine, but two, Racism in Ukraine, racism in Poland along the border is not an excuse for us to write off Ukraine. Because understand, every black and brown person in Ukraine, if Russia takes over this country, will suffer catastrophic consequences. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was very helpful. Uh, Dr. Lusain, would you like to go next? Uh, I am happy to go and I, I truly appreciate it. Uh, uh, following uh, Dr. Ashby and Kimberly, because uh, I think they really laid out uh, some important uh, uh, comments. Uh, let me just make a couple of comments about the war and then uh, speak to specifically uh, about the issue of, of race uh, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, so this war uh, is illegal, and that's really important to underscore. It's a violation of international law as well as regional law and regional policies. It violates the UN Charter uh, and it violates the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Russian Federation is not a member of NATO or of the European Union, but it is a member of the Council of Europe. And it's a signatory to the European Court, uh, the European uh, Charter of Human Rights. I think uh, along the lines of what Kimberly had to say, following this war, there will be cases at the European Court of Human Rights uh, filed against Russia because of Russia carrying out horrific policies uh, against civilians. Uh, Dr. Ashby is absolutely right. It goes beyond NATO. Uh, this is the fiction that uh, Putin has put out. And part of it, of course, is tied to the Warsaw Pact doesn't exist anymore, which existed during the Cold War. Uh, but it goes way beyond that. And I think Russia is more threatened by the European Union. There are uh, the four nations who are on the border of there are four nations on the border of Ukraine who are members of NATO, but they also are members of the European Union. And what happened in 2013, 2014, uh, under uh, former President uh, Yanukovych, there was a flirtation and a process started to bring Ukraine closer and into uh, these stages for EU membership. Putin did not like that. He presented a counter offer on the sort of economic side. Uh, Yanukovych, uh, Yanukovych uh, backed off, and then that's what sparked the Maiden Square uprisings uh, in, February, in January and February 2014. Uh, Yanukovych was thrown out of office, and then Russia seized Crimea. And then that's really when you know, this modern stage of this invasion uh, happened. And so that had nothing to do with NATO. This is Putin, uh, Putin's own kind of initiative. And the other thing, if you hear, uh, you know, if you read or listen to Putin's speech, uh, his framing that the people of UK Ukraine and people of Belarus are Russians is a fundamentalist uh, understanding that is not negotiable from his vantage point. This is not a sovereign country. These are Russian people. And under Putin's understanding, he has a right to seize the country. Uh, now, in terms of the issue of relate, uh, race, I think there are three uh, issues that, that my colleagues have, have uh, talked about a couple of. One is the racist framing of the crisis, this whole civilized Europe versus non-civilized rest of the world uh, was on display. And it came from journalists, uh, but it also came from European leaders. The Bulgarian prime minister, for example, said uh, this wave of refugees, you know, these which could be terrorists and all kinds of people, you know, that's what we're used to, not these intelligent and educated people that we're seeing coming from uh, Ukraine. And uh, Kimberly's right, a lot of that takes place in the um, broader context of the discrimination that's going on at the borders, 
uh, but also the chaos that's going at the borders. The, they're reporting 800,000 people uh, have left the country. That is just chaos beyond chaos. Uh, and in that context, then you saw some discrimination and then you saw statements from uh, the African Union and then from the various countries. Now, I would underscore that there are thousands of people of African descent in Ukraine, which includes not just students, but residents with work permits. It includes uh, immigrants who have overstayed their visa, but it also includes Afro-Ukrainians, people who were born and raised in Ukraine. That's their homeland. That's their nationality. Uh, there's even an Afro-Ukrainian member of parliament, a guy named Zan Belenuik, I believe that's how it's pronounced, who was a wrestler, uh, who uh, now is a member of parliament. He came in uh, when Zelensky came in. And so, you know, that I'm worried as well. I was in uh, Ukraine in 2014 uh, in the spring after the war broke out, and I was working with an organization called the Africa Center. And it was very much focused on looking at the rights of people of African descent and what had emerged fairly quickly, uh, somewhat as, as Dr. Ashby uh, has said in Kimberly, uh, is that in the Eastern part of the country, African students were being attacked. Some were kidnapped, uh, it was horrific. And then the Republic of Luhansk and the Republic of Donish are run by far right uh, uh, militias. And I am very concerned that uh, the people who are left behind will be suffering seriously uh, because you've got uh, these extremists uh, who are in power. Now there are far right forces that are pro-Ukrainian uh, as well, and you know, and they've been active. But in the East, you've got you know these extremists, neo Nazis, the whole spectrum of folks, uh, and so that needs to be uh, have a lens on it as well. Uh, and then, lastly, I would say I think you know there are four things that need to be done. Uh, one, there should be a vigorous focus on diplomacy. This should be how there should be a push for immediate ceasefire that comes from everywhere uh, in the international system. Uh, second, uh, these border countries need to absolutely open up in, uh, their uh, uh, reception of people who need to get out uh, and not just be stuck. And they literally will be targets uh, if they're stuck at these borders. So NATO, the United Nations, the OSCE all need to facilitate uh, those borders being open for people to have safe passage. Uh, third, uh, there should be direct punishment of Putin. Uh, there shouldn't be punishment of the Republican people, I mean, the Russian people as much as possible. Putin should not feel safe uh, financially and, and otherwise uh, as he carries out this really disastrous uh, war. Uh, and then lastly, if uh, the Russians actually topple the Zelensky uh, government, there should be no recognition uh, whatsoever of anybody that's installed uh, by the Russians. Uh, so let me leave it there and then just kind of, uh, again, thank, thank everybody for their comments. Thank you, Dr. Zain. Dr. Lugodefabritz. Thank you. So um, this was sort of my, well, yeah, I, I, I gathered all these people together because I teach Russian at the only HBC that teaches Russian. So first thing I want to say is please understand that at a time like this, these are the brains that are required so one, this is a call out to the humanities, unless you have institutions like Howard that support the study of languages like Russian, we will not have experts like Professor Lusain, a future doctor, St. Julian Vernon, um, and Dr. Ashby to help us negotiate these crises through these important analytical lenses. So I just wanted to start with that. Um, but as far as this particular crisis is concerned, um, being Puerto Rican, of course, I, I started looking at the Latin American reaction to this. And you know, still south of the equator, um, this is equally as concerning also because Latin American responses have not been lockstep. All we have heard is sort of the United States and the European responses. Um, Latin American is much more interesting, let's just put it that way. Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua have come out 
putting out strong statements of support um, in support of Vladimir Putin and the invasion of Ukraine. Meantime, Colombia, República Dominicana, Ecuador, Argentina, Mexico um, have come out against Brazil. We don't know yet. It, it's been sort of on the fence edge. Um, we'll, we'll see what Bolsonaro has to say tomorrow after his first cup of coffee. Um, so this is to point out also that one of the things that is going to affect this is networks, right? This whole idea of intersectionality, not just in terms of the emerging migrant crisis, but also the emerging resource crisis. Uh, we have an issue where if you look at the map, one of the reasons why Ukraine has mattered strategically is that until Nord Stream 2 was almost finished, all of the major gas pipelines that ran from Russia and Central Asia ran through Ukraine. So um, there is that part of the equation that really one needs to think about. If one needs to think about just general population, being able to stay warm in a really cold winter is important, right? And then back down to the whole problem of race in this great crisis clearly is the fact that this really questions how we can look at the whole idea of how race affects international politics. Because in as everybody has already commented at the core, this is a colonial invasion going on. This is Vladimir Putin deciding that he wants to reinstitute 19th century Russian empire. Uh, and that is problematic. And then all sorts of different categorizations of people come in. We've talked mostly about Black Africans, right? Um, and we also need to talk about Roma people who in Europe are just constantly and consistently considered inferior citizens and face amazing prejudice and face even greater challenges when they cross the border. That's one. And the other also is the interesting manifestation of Zelensky, right? And one of the things that has been observed is that in a war of denazification, you're attacking a country with a Jewish president, right? And this sort of questions how, this is one of the more interesting things I get to explain to my students, that we might think of Jewishness as a religion in the United States, but in the imperial Russian system, it's a nationality. It's equivalent to a race. And that also creates all sorts of problems for those of Jewish descent in that community in Ukraine. So it's a great moment of sort of intersectionality, um, a moment that reflects how do we really think about race in the concept of international relations. and. As an instructor at Howard, it talks about how important it is that we have people that look like the people in this room. Um, because I, I love bringing these panels together now because we, we break all sort of analytical statistics. This is not your sort of traditional Brookings panel, definitely. And the insight that it provides is even more valuable in a situation like this. Thank you. Thank you all so much uh, for, for providing such rich context for what is going on. We've been joined by quite a lo lot of people who I'm sure are interested in, um, in everything that we're going to be discussing, which you all have already set the stage for. And we already have a good number of questions in here. So I would just want to get to it because I think everybody's going to have important questions. And if I could ask you all, please, if you want to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A function because we can keep track of it better there as opposed to the chat function. Um, so I'm happy to see some of the folks who are on my earlier panel with Ambassador Spratlin and Ambassador Elam Thomas join us here for this one as well. So we'll get it started with Catherine Gilliard. Uh, we have seen a lot of coverage and even more takes about what's happening, why and what it means. In your opinion, what are people getting wrong? What are people getting right? And what are they missing? What considerations should people covering this like me make sure to take? She's a student of journalism. So what are the important things that she, you know, 
aspires to be an international correspondent. And Dr. Lusain, you mentioned that, and I've seen the videos of the way that journalists have been saying highly inappropriate things. Um, what advice would you have for this student um, as, as we move forward with this situation? Okay, uh, so uh, great question. Uh, one thing uh, I did see quickly that somebody asked, uh, what is the Roma? Uh, and just to clarify that, uh, it's people who are sometimes referred to as gypsies, uh, but uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, the preference, uh, the term that people use, they sometimes will use gypsy, but they prefer uh, Roma. And it's a community uh, that has been persecuted uh, basically for centuries. Uh, they were hurt, uh, they were, uh, genocide was committed against them during the uh, uh, Holocaust, uh, during uh, World War II by the Nazis, uh, and they've been persecuted uh, since then. And so that's important to note because as, as uh, Dr. Fabrice notes, there are many different communities uh, in the region, uh, including people of African descent. Uh, just in terms of sort of the overall framing, uh, what this invasion is doing is in many ways restructuring uh, the global alliance. And it's important that there are voices from the global south that are part of that discussion. Uh, issues have been raised about whether or not there's even a need for NATO. Uh, and that discussion should not be uh, taken off the table. Uh, but it should be in the broader context of what does security mean, uh, not only physical security, climate security, right? What does it mean in terms of uh, security around the social realm? And so uh, I would push that this uh, transition that's happening opens up the door for there to be broader voices uh, that can have a say uh, in going forward uh, on all of these kinds of concerns. Anyone else want to chime in? Yeah, I would say from a journalist perspective, one of the challenges is disinformation and misinformation that's circulated all over the place. And it's coming from multiple sources, multiple places. And I think what's critical is elevating those voices who are on the ground, particularly Ukrainians, before the invasion happened, where were the Ukrainians on media talking about their experiences, talking about what they're encountering, what this conflict means, what this environment is. Even at a higher level, a lot of the statements by President Zelensky, <laughs> they will only take a small snippet of what he was talking about and spit in another narrative when he was actively criticizing the European security architecture for the way that Ukraine is being sacrificed, the international system, that was within the first 10 minutes of his Munich security conference and everyone missed that. So I would say, look for trusted sources. And this isn't to say go against social media, it's just be more careful of who you're following and who you're sharing videos and posts from, especially if there's no link to uh, article. People are putting stuff in quotes that have no way of connecting to anything. And so to pay attention to that uh, as you're trying to gather information about what's taking place. And of course, follow Kimberly, if you're not already, for accurate representation of the environment. Actually, shout out to the dynamic duo. We have Kimberly right over here. Um, uh, helping to coordinate migrant issues on the border. I need to shout out to Terrell Starr who is leading Africa, he is the African American specialist on the African diaspora in Ukraine. The man spent years researching the group. He's like, in addition to being a journalist, he's on Twitter. He is right now embedded on the ground with Ukrainian forces. So I know a lot of us kind of wake up in the morning and, and cross our fingers to see his, every, about every six hours he posts in, I'm alive. Like that's where he is. So I just wanted to shout out Terrell. Also, um, take a little bit of time and read some of these people's speeches. In 2007, Putin made a speech where he talked about the fact that the thing that he thought was most dangerous was the world was becoming a unipolar regime. Basically, US and NATO, right? He conflated US, NATO, but the world is unipolar. And 
it's not being nice to Russia, and that's a bad thing. Um, so if these, a lot of these um, political figures, people in power, um, they will telegraph their moves in their speeches up to 2020 to 2007, 15 years ahead of time. So if, again, but then again, this relies on having the specialist that can take the speech in Russian, translate it into English, distill it, and watch for consistency. So watch for consistency, right? Because consistency is at the core of a lot of this. Um, I agree with all of these comments. And I think if you're going to be a journalist and you want to focus on the region, you need to learn the languages. Um, you need to learn Russian, read Ukrainian, because what we've seen, I mean, just two weeks ago, we had CNN and, the B and BBC saying, President Zelensky said that Russia was gonna attack on February 16th. And it was because they had taken a statement he had put out in Ukrainian and they had Google translated and Google Translate didn't understand impersonal third person constructions in Russian or Ukrainian. So what was actually said was they have threatened us with war and that became, there will be a war on February 16th. And it was about creating a day of unity for Ukrainians. So when you see instances like that, I mean, that shows you why you need to have some expertise on this region. And I think that's why me, Terrell, and many of us who work on the region, that's why you're seeing us all over the news and doing interviews, because we know if we don't do it, someone who doesn't know about the region most certainly will. People who literally, you know, they Google things or they take information that we've put out publicly and then they go repeat it and they have no context and no knowledge about what they're talking about. So I think as a journalist, you have to really interrogate your sources and, and think about who is saying this, where is this coming from? Can I verify this? Um, and I think that's hard right now, especially with social media, um, because like we didn't have this kind of wide you know, social media presence in 2008 in the Georgian war, especially not in the Chechen wars in the late 90s, early 2000s, or in the Balkan wars in the 90s. So this is kind of new, the amount of information that's going around. And, not, and it's not new, of course, to war. I mean, we've seen this in Syria and Libya, but I mean, for this region, this is still a really new development, I think. Thank you for that. Let's keep going here. Um, here's a question from Jacob Herring. Should the US respond economically like we are currently doing or should we be responding militarily? Can you repeat the question again? Should the US respond economically like we are currently doing or should we be responding militarily? So I think economically, we still haven't unleashed a full force of sanctions that we can implement. One is in the energy sector. So at the same time that we're going after Russia, we're still paying Russia for oil. And that amounts to a little over 10% of US oil imports. And so I think there are other avenues that we can pursue. One that hasn't been talked about but should be on the table as well is mentioned as we're going after the oligarchs is that Putin's regime has ties to organized crime and those people have no limits on how they will operate, what they're gonna involve themselves in, the way the money flows. And that could help hide a lot of these assets that we may be out in the open for the governments to target in Europe and the United States. And so adding that to the table as well as ramping up the pressure on criminal networks that are helping to fund the regime, helping to execute a lot of their work, their dirty work uh, should be added to the table. And I think one of the challenges that the Biden administration is trying to straddle is to implement sanctions at the same time that don't cause inflation within the United States and other adverse impacts on our economies. And I think he needs to have a tough conversation with the American people that if we are supporting Ukraine, supporting an international system that favors territorial integrity, self-determination of smaller countries, as well as freedom of the press and openness of societies that we need to consider what we are willing to stand in order to fight for that, not just for Ukraine, but for a host of other countries around the world to stand in solidarity with them. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I, I 
100% agree uh, with all of that. Uh, I think we absolutely should not intervene militarily, uh, neither should NATO. Uh, that will only exacerbate a situation and make it exponentially worse uh, for uh, people in the region. Uh, it would be destructive beyond uh, uh, belief. Uh, there needs to be, again, aggressive diplomacy uh, that intervenes. Now, there's a bit of a, uh, a caveat because if a situation arises where the Russian military begins to commit genocide at a massive level, then NATO really and the US really have to a uh, difficult issue to wrestle with because do you just kind of allow that to happen under the uh, principle that because Ukraine is not a member of NATO, you will not intervene or do you intervene and risk escalating uh, the situation, uh, you know, in ways that are just, you know, unimaginable. So, you know, it is a really uh, trying time. Uh, I think another factor that should be uh, uh, looked at in all of this is uh, in Russia. And the anti-war movement in Russia uh, has been very uh, vigorous, even in the face of persecution and arrest. Uh, and, and everything else that they're facing. But we should also pay attention to that because uh, potentially if it really goes bad for Putin, uh, Putin's own uh, position uh, may be in jeopardy and that would come from what happens in Russia. And I wanted to say that um, ec economics and military are not the only option. Uh, we also have a level of culture and under culture, boom, right? Let's talk about disinformation, how Russia has developed this amazing machine for disinformation right now. Right now, they just shut down the two last major independent sources of news in Russia. Your average Russian grandma living out in the middle of Russia has no access to some of this information, right? In addition to that, we have other forms of cultural tools that we can use. So firstly, fight this information, first and foremost. Um, two, figure out how to get information into Russia. And three, we really, this is now a real threat. We have a generation of Russians that have only had access to the stuff Putin feeds them, and the whole idea that they might end up killing people in Ukraine is a major moment of cognitive dissonance. And the relatives they leave behind have totally bought into the false narrative that this is about NATO expansion. Um, even me in my circles, right? I, I have been being fed that, well, you know, why do you blame Putin? He was so upset about NATO expansion. It's just like, um, you know, you're upset about NATO expansion, you go to the United Nations or you make a sweet enough deal that they, you know, you know, that, that they will like. You just don't start bombing thousand year old churches or archives or museums or kill children on the street, that too. It also has made NATO more popular in Ukraine than it's ever been before. So, and then you have, I think Sweden and Finland are you know trying to gain NATO membership? So this is when we say NATO wasn't the point. Even in Putin's declaration of war speech in Russian, NATO was not emphasized. Um, and I think when we talk about um, when we talk about the stakes of this and, and what the United States can do, President Biden has already said and he's emphasized that there will not be American troops in Ukraine. And the few hundred troops he did have there who were training. Um, Ukrainian soldiers in Western Ukraine, they've been in Romania and Poland for the past two weeks. But we can send humanitarian aid. We have an incredible, you know, arsenal of medical help that we can help send. Food, I mean, airdrops that are helping with humanitarian, you know, issues are possible, but this is going to require a lot of NATO cooperation for us to be able to do this. And unfortunately, we're going to have to try to negotiate with Russia to allow for you know, protection of civilians and like a green zone that would allow civilians to get 
help, but also to allow people to remove, you know, people who've died. Um, so unfortunately, we're going to have to depend on Putin and trust Putin and, and, and the Russian administration to at least be somewhat of a rational actor that acts in good faith when it comes to the humanitarian crisis. Is that going to be the case? That's a different question. Okay, thank you all. So let's keep it moving. And I, so a couple of years ago when we uh, at the Bunch Center, every year we have a theme uh, for the year. And a few years ago, we focused on Russia uh, with the help of Professor Lugarif Abritz. And we, and, and Terrell Starr did come and speak to us. And it was a fascinating presentation that he gave on the various ethnicities in Russia and the former Soviet Union and how Russia kind of utilized those differences to, to get what they want. So there's a question here from Abby Ferguson about how do you see Russia utilizing the racial issues being seen now at the borders as propaganda or fodder for the war? Oh, go ahead, Kimberly. Um, so I, I've been talking and interviewing about this and I'm writing about this. Um, we've seen in 2016 and 2020, how Russia has utilized disinformation and, and profited from black pain and black suffering in the United States, right? To undermine our democracy and to undermine um, like the public protests in the George Floyd uh, protests that we saw in 2020 um, across Russia, they had on screens and they were calling it, you know, um, the protest looting, they were only showing, you know, busted up CVSs. They were not talking about the issues that were causing these protests. And so when I think about this and I think about the images that we're seeing at the border and how, despite the fact that you do have people working on these issues, and I know it seems whataboutism or it seems like I'm, you know, poo-pooing the situation, but I'm not. There are people on the ground, Ukrainians and Poles who are helping on the ground. So when we see these instances of racism, we do have to remember that fact, that th this is a wartime situation. There are other contextual issues going on, but many of these students are getting helped. Even those who are being, you know, who are experiencing racism and, and racist violence and harassment, they are also getting help. And we have to keep that in mind because as we see Russian forces using this disinformation, the running narrative will be, why do we care about Ukraine? We should just let Ukraine fall to Russia because they're racist. And that's not beneficial to Europe and it's certainly not beneficial to any other black or brown people who live in Ukraine right now or who are trying to get out of Ukraine. But moreover, Putin and Russia are in no way, shape or form absent of participation in global white supremacy. Um, so don't let, don't let this disinformation that he's denazifying Ukraine fool you and that Putin has very often and publicly aligned himself with far right and white supremacist forces in Russia who also have contacts in the United States. And I think that th these are the contexts that most sources and media don't know and don't understand. And that's what's kind of missing from this, this discourse right now. Yeah, I would add that Russian state funded media is active in multiple languages. And what we mainly pay attention to is what's coming out in English sometimes Spanish and definitely not French. And they've been expanding the type of languages that they use to engage in disinformation in different parts of the world. And so I think what should take place now and for the future, and it's a project I'm working on with colleagues at my organization is to start looking at these different types of languages and how those narratives are taking shape. Because I can assure you that it's going on in French, it's going on in Spanish, and it's going on in Arabic. It's using social media, it's using the three different state funded media operations, it's using influencers in these different regions in the global south. And so that's all coalescing together that advance these narratives about the war from the Russian perspective. And the other aspect that race is playing into this is how Russia takes advantage of these types of situations to have their version of anti-West uh, merge with anti-colonialism in different parts of the world. And so that then starts to tie the two together in ways that they should not be together because what Russia is fighting against Europe and the United States is not what say uh, Central African Republic may be doing against French. 
uh, the, uh, the French government. And so it's all multi-layered and complex. And so it's just to have an awareness of all the tools that Russia is using to advance their own type of interests, arguments to build support uh, by linking it to local struggles in different parts of the world. And I also want to highlight that I wouldn't put it past the Russians to either use government agencies or oligarchs or criminal networks to start building more troll farms to target African Americans and people of color in the United States like they did ahead of the 2020 election. They already have the infrastructure, they know the individuals to go to, and I it's maybe already taking place now, but we haven't been able to focus on it because you need a lot of like data analytics capacity to track all that across Facebook and Twitter. So that's something to be on the lookout as well as we're in an election year and then we'll be moving to 2024 for a, a bigger election for the presidency. Yeah, and not yeah. just not just that, but um, I just wanna point the Southeast with the growing diaspora of Latin American folk there and how they're, amplifying a lot of this disinformation, right? Um, uh, some of the stuff that Russia puts out is not necessarily original to them. They'll just amplify things that support. So they, um, okay, they're called information phantoms in, in Russian uh, literature. So they could be totally true, mostly true, somewhat false, totally false. They don't care. They just care that you're gonna go, I like, and then send it from El Salvador to your aunt up here in Miami and your aunt in Miami shares it with her your church group. And that's gonna be a mess. And it's gonna be in Spanish. And if you've ever seen RT in Espanol, I actually watch it every now and then because it's really slick and beautiful and professionally produced. And every now and then they have the hi, the the, the Colombian dance troupe is appearing in Moscow. Look how beautiful they, they are. They're in the Bolshoi. So they create this amazingly attractive package. Um, in the visual level, in the data level, um, they create really appealing dopamine reach, click like, um, and, and that's a big part of it. And the Spanish language has me absolutely concerned for the south southeast of the United States because it's like a boomerang coming back. Um, and, and that's, yeah. Yeah, I, I would really, really underscore, uh, uh, as Kimberly said, the racism that exists in Russia. So while there's kind of a lot of attention focused appropriately on what's going on in Ukraine, the background of this is in Russia, uh, it is not safe for uh, African students, people of African descent. I have never felt safe in Russia uh, versus being in Ukraine. Uh, it, it's just world of difference. And that is not accidental. Uh, we uh, often have, organized uh, region-wide meetings of people of African descent uh, in Europe. And we had people from all over from Ukraine, but from sub Slovakia, from Hungary, from England, France, almost impossible to get anybody from Russia because in Russia, people can't really raise these kinds of issues. And so that needs to be put up front. And then I think as uh, Dr. Ashby said, uh, the, it's been nonstop the uh, Russian targeting of African-American communities uh, with disinformation and misinformation. And again, it gets kind of lost because it rises up and we just so focus when it's you know a high profile election, but it's been ongoing. And so that also needs to be something that again, we do not uh, drop from uh, an assessment of what's going on. Okay, so we're getting a lot of questions in here. I know we're probably not gonna to get to all of them in the next 35 minutes. So I will invite the panelists to peruse these. And if you can answer them in writing, please do that. Um, in the meantime, there's a question here that I wanna ask because somebody, when I posted that I was gonna be moderating this um, question, somebody posed the question, a similar question to me on Facebook last night. So, so an anonymous uh, participant has asked, could the panel speak towards the 2014 Ukrainian election and the alleged coup and how that is impacting this situation? Let me get on this one. <laughs> Cause I came, I came back from Ukraine a, a few months before Euromaidan and I have seen this lie, it's a lie, but also 
the Russian ambassador just repeated the slide at the UN meeting a few minutes ago. Um, the idea that's been spread by Russia since 2014 is that the government that was elected, that was put in after Yanukovych fled to Russia was a, an American plant. It's a fake color revolution. This is disinformation. And it's dangerous because as we've seen, we're, we're seeing Russia use this language now to say that the current government in Ukraine is illegitimate, that somehow you know, it's okay that they are violating Ukrainian territory sovereignty and committing war crimes. But moreover, this ties into Putin's argument and his allegation that the government of Ukraine is just a bunch of neo-Nazis or they're fascists. We have seen this been said like since 2014. And so he has had this narrative that's been repeated in RT, in Sputnik, in Pervi Canal, like in you know, the Russian media sources. And now it's, it's trickled all over the United States. It's trickled all over Western media and in blogs and in and podcasts. People are repeating this, um, you know, this talking point that is fundamentally false and easily provable that it's false. But the seed is already there. I mean, I gave a talk yesterday and a student asked me, I heard that the Ukrainian government was a CIA plant. And I'm like, what? But also, huh? <laughs> Where does this come from? But it's because the little seeds have been sown since 2014. But also I think one of the most people aren't thinking about this is undermining Zelensky. So when he says he's denazifying Ukraine, but people are like Zelensky's Jewish, but Zelensky's not really the president. He's being run by America. He's being run by the West. So not only is that problematic because it, it completely undermines Ukrainian sovereignty, but it's also racist. It's repeating some of the worst tropes about globalism and, and that we see in anti-Semitic um, remarks towards Jews. So I think we have to be very careful in how we deal with that. Yeah, I have not much else to add to that other than we just need to be very careful overall on the type of information that we're receiving and sharing because it feeds into a lot of these low level disinformation efforts that are taking place. Uh, what I also want to highlight is just to be diligent in the information that you're processing and just to be careful what you're sharing. So in addition to what you're consuming, what you're <laughs> sending retweet on, what you're sending through private messages to friends, uh, it could be through other like WhatsApp channels. So just to be mindful of that type of information that's being passed around and to then just do sometimes a quick Google search, go on Wikipedia, which is usually pretty good with information though as a former academic, I wouldn't put that in a research paper in terms of the Wikipedia link, uh, just to keep that in mind. Okay, so it looks like um, Professor Lusane and Tania um, had connectivity issues. I'm guessing they're on campus, most likely so. Um, I'm going to pick a question for us to think about, which is actually fantastically useful at this time, which is um, where would you suggest that I start in terms of books, lectures, sessions like this to set a solid foundation for myself as I start to try and figure out these different global systems and economies and how they are connected? Um, so starting places for, you know, if you want to create your own Russia, Ukraine 101. I feel like this is like an entire comps PhD list. I'm <laughs> working on. Um, Serhi Pokey's book, The Frontline is actually really good. It's newly released. And I think the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute has uh, chapters available to the public now because of Putin's ahistorical lies, like they're, they're specifically, um, they kind of help you understand that. And this book was written like two years before all this happened. It's just really timely that it came out. And it's a good, easy and accessible understanding of Ukrainian history written by Sergei Plohi, the world's foremost expert on Ukrainian history. And he's also Ukrainian. Um, so I think that's a good place to start. 
Um, but also, I think if you think about media sources, the Kiev Independent is an amazing English language media source um, that's independent, you know, from um, any government source. Um, but there are also a lot of explainers. If you go to Harvard, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, H-U-R-I, um, it's either .com or .edu, probably .edu. Um, they have resources, they have a list of resources that explain Ukrainian history, where and like where does this conflict come from? What happened in 2013? There's a lot of good academic, rigorous information out there online that I think people can engage with. I would also say that and understand the context more, especially Russian thinking of why they're motivated to pursue this route is videos by on YouTube with Masha Gessen because she's so well informed. She is Russian uh, American uh, and she just provides such helpful information about what type of environment exists in Russia, why it's difficult to protest there, what the challenges you face in protesting. Because I know when the invasion started, it's like, where are all the Russians protesting? And it's like, when you've been beaten down in your society for decades, it's very hard for you to go out there and risk the possibility of not only arrest, fines, losing your job, being put in prison for a number of years simply by saying, I challenge this war that our government is engaged in. And so it's not the same level of what you would expect and say in the United States if we're talking about war. So I would say check out Masha Gessen on YouTube. Podcast wise, Sean Guillory. Um, I, I, he is an amazing, just everybody who is anybody eventually lands on his podcast. Um, and he's got them at all level. He's got them at beginner to pretty advanced. So I would say Sean Guillory. And also because one lemonade out of this whole pandemic is how a lot of these really in-depth think tanks are doing webinars right now. So I will shout out to the Canon Institute, which is sort of my favorite place in town. Um, they do amazing regular presentations. Also, uh, New York University's Jordan Center um, has a lot of podcasts, um, recorded live webinars, um, not just relating to this, but also just a as a primer for the whole area. Professor Lusane, the question was, how do I start getting myself acquainted with um, these areas and fields, you know? So we're asking for sort of favorite 101 resource for getting up to speed in the area. So there are resources available uh, in addition to what my colleagues uh, noted uh, in Europe. So in the Council of Europe, for example, uh, there's a body, the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, ECRI, uh, and they do uh, reports on issues of race and discrimination uh, in the entire region of Europe. Uh, but it includes Russia, it includes uh, countries in the East, and they do specific focus also on issues of uh, affecting uh, Roma. So those are available. Uh, there are also reports available from the United Nations uh, through its CERD, the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, and those reports are available as well. So that gives you sort of a firsthand kind of reporting coming from, uh, from the region. And again, in addition to uh, suggestions that were made by my colleagues. Okay, so, um, hi, so Tania's back. Um, we had a moment of lack of connectivity. Um, so I'm also trying to sort through the questions. Um, Heather, Dr. Ashby, do you see any question that you have found particularly interesting in there? Sort of round rubbing answer to question here. Oh, I was starting to answer uh, some of these. Uh, so one that I'm working on now is what do you think leaders, especially African leaders, need to do to help evacuate their citizens out of Ukraine? And so I would note that it, in terms of what goes on behind like government bureaucracies, it could be really complicated if there's not a large diplomatic presence in these countries for African countries to try to negotiate uh, having your citizens exit the country. And so as been 
has already been emphasized is diplomacy and to get on the phone 24 seven with the countries that refugees are moving to, to get away from this conflict, to set up uh, an environment where they won't be challenged at the border because of visa issues that they're providing with safe housing, food, uh, and the ability sh should they choose to leave the region and who's going to fund that. And an important aspect of that is partnerships between African countries and the European Union. There was a recent summit between African leaders and the European Union. So using that as a mechanism to say, hey, European Union, you want to do business development with us, you want to do other resource extraction. Uh, we need your assistance in getting our citizens out of this harmful situation by whatever means that is necessary for uh, a humanitarian corridor to get them out. Yeah, so I, I really wanna underscore what uh, Dr. Ashby just said, because that really, there are a lot of countries that simply don't have the resources. There are small countries, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, for example, there are countries, they just do not have the personnel to send uh, or to be able to get out. And so there needs to be intentionality on the part of the EU, the uh, OSCE, the Organization for Security and, and Cooperation in Europe, uh, the council, all those regional bodies need to be linked with the African Union, uh, with the regional bodies out of Asia. Uh, and they need to all be at the border. They need to be on the ground uh, facilitating uh, this uh, ability of people to, to be able to move and, and as uh, Dr. Ashby said, to not only cross the borders, but to uh, be able to get food, to get housing, uh, to be secure. And Kimberly, would you like to add anything to those comments? Um, I just want to reinforce um, what Dr. Hussein and Dr. Ashby have already said. I mean, this is a key part that's missing in a lot of our conversations about what's going on. It is very difficult for, and I, I've had to, you know, evacuate from a country during war when I, I was in Madagascar and the civil war started. And if you don't have an embassy or a consulate you can make contact with in country, it is incredibly difficult to try to get out. And, uh, you know, as you heard, like students in, who are from Kenya, there is no embassy, there's no Kenyan embassy in Poland. So your nearest shot is Austria, which is thousands of miles away from where you could be located in Ukraine. So we have these issues, um, you know, that we're facing at the border. Um, so we have to also kind of remember that. And when we think about what African countries can do, it, it, you, it is you're gonna have to work on your diplomatic presence, but you can't solve these problems overnight. Like these things take years to build and to fund. Um, so it, it, it's not looking good and, and, and we're gonna need some international help here because these countries can't do it on their own right now. Good. So uh, there's a question here that I think really goes to the core of where we as scholars of color can really contribute, which is, um, could you speak more about the implications of the conflict to the ethnic groups there? Um, and this is your opportunity also to tease out one of our wonderful um, discussion points in our conferences in this region is, is it ethnicity? Is it race? Is it a nationality? And what is the difference? But um, sort of what is the implication for ethnic groups? And feel free to expand um, on that terminology. Uh, what are the implications of, of this conflict um, other than bad? Yeah, so um, anybody can start. So I, I think one of the things uh, we have not talked about is how people kind of ended up there in the first place, and particularly uh, people of African descent. And uh, much of this goes back to the Soviet period when universities uh, broadly in the Soviet Union, but particularly in Russia and Ukraine and a few other places, uh, essentially opened up their doors uh, for people to come. Uh, this included not only people from uh, African countries, uh, particularly after 1957, after uh, the independence of Ghana and then many other countries in Africa, but also African-Americans uh, who came over to study. When the Soviet Union broke up, uh, the uh, doors still remained open uh, for people to come and study. Uh, in many ways, it was cheaper and, and you know, there were other advantages. A lot of those 
schools, however, are in Eastern Ukraine. And that's why you had so many uh, people from the various African countries in India and Asia and elsewhere uh, in the Eastern region is because that's where a lot of the schools are, medical schools, professional schools. Uh, and when the war broke out in 2014, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, it created uh, situations where in many of those students were under attack. Uh, and one example of a cooper cooperation that happened was that a deal was cut uh, that involved in part the Ukrainian government, the American embassy, the Nigerian government, and a train was sent to Eastern uh, Europe, I mean, to Eastern Ukraine uh, to bring out uh, people. And I think it's something like a thousand students were, were brought out. Uh, brought to safety to uh, to the capital. So there's examples of uh, cooperation that can happen. But the, you know the history is really important uh, to know why people were there and why people came and and found uh, that they could get uh, an education, they could get university training uh, in uh, ways that they could not get uh, back home. And I think that's a good point. Um, when we do think about the long relationship that Ukraine and Russia, like under the Soviet Union, have had with African countries, particularly decolonizing African countries. And so when we think about, I mean, like just thinking about now, why do we see so many African students, you know, trying to leave? It's because Ukraine has continued to welcome African students and they've continued to study and also live in Ukraine. Um, but also like in and in Russia, like uh, the biggest black populations, African populations, or, or you know, they're studying in, in Russia and Ukraine because educational access is possible. The visa regime is one of the easier ones. It's much harder to get a visa to countries like Germany and France, and it's cheaper to live. And so you have a lot of African students who have to make an opportunity cost decision. Um, like, do you stay in your country or do you go to Western Europe, which is it's almost impossible to get into, or do you take advantage of the opportunities that are presented in Eastern Europe but then you also have to grapple with racism. And so they're having to make really difficult decisions um, you know, to pursue betterment for themselves. And now the universities they attend are being bombed. So it's they're being re-harmed re and re-traumatized throughout this process. Can you all hear me? Okay, I'm so sorry. Our internet here at the Bunch Center has completely shut down. So I am on my phone and I cannot see all of the questions, the 30 plus questions that were here before. I only now see three. So I'm going to let Dr. Lugoda Fabritz continue um, figuring out what questions to focus on. Um, but I'm going to be here because I was, somebody is trying to not let me be in this conversation and I don't appreciate it. So please carry on and Dr. Lugoda Fabritz will read out the questions. So Dr. Ashley, you wanna add anything else to the to this point before we move on? I uh, know, I think everything that's been said has been great. All right, great. So um, now, uh, of course, sometimes the more complicated questions are the short ones, which are, so what are the economic implications of all of this? Um, which is amazingly broad. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw it out and uh, pick sort of, your um, aspect of the economy that you think is most illustrative of the possible implications for those. For instance, I went to fill up my gas tank today and yes, gas has gone up about 30 cents the gallon since the beginning of the week. So um, I know that I'm feeling those economic implications, but you know, you know, Russianist that I am, I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Like it's gonna happen. So uh, I guess I'll start with Dr. Ashby, who who is in the thick of that, and then I'll go round robin. Yeah, I think energy is gonna be the most important focus. And it may not necessarily be because the war is taking place, but also the greed of these companies who are taking advantage of the environment to increase prices across the board, call it, blame it on inflation, blame it on government policy. And that's uh, 
uh, aspect of it, but a lot of it is just the greed and what they could get away with in certain unregulated environments. So that's something to track and become more involved in, in terms of talking to your congressional representatives about how to manage these companies and the way they're just trying to gouge people for all is possible at the same time. You have individuals who they may be upset with who are fighting for raises at jobs, who are exercising their right to resign from positions that don't suit them. So you have companies who can't impose their will on workers as much anymore. And that's also a whole other aspect of this. Uh, tied to the energy aspect is just the importance of developing greener ways of technology for energy. And if we started that seriously years ago in terms of the for Europe, for the United States, it would have given Russia a lot less leverage in this situation and we wouldn't be continuing to give them money at the same time we're trying to tell them to get out of this war and stop their aggression. Uh, I think the other thing to track and in, in this is tied to the greed, even though we don't import significant amounts of wheat from Ukraine and from Russia, there's going to be an increase in food prices that these greedy companies are going to try to exercise in order to take advantage of the situation. So that's another aspect to pay attention to. And I think less studied uh, is what your retirement is invested in. And so it could be tied up with a lot of Russian companies that are partnered with Western companies that are starting to pull out from those partnerships. And so if you're at retirement age or you have a 401k or you're just doing stock trading on your phone or tablet is to be aware of what your money is being invested in and to shift away from anything that involves supporting the Russian Federation and giving them funds. So Kimberly raised her hand. Me? Yeah, did you raise your hand? Sorry. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, Professor Lassane. So uh, I would really, 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 really uh, echo uh, what Dr. Ashby said. Uh, the greening of the world really would be significant in having an impact on uh, what we're seeing in terms of uh, the this crisis that's very much tied to our dependence on uh, these gas and uh, oil sources. Uh, Russia is basically a gas station. That's its economy. It produces nothing. Nobody's wearing Russian clothes. Nobody's watching Russian televisions. Uh, they have gas and oil. And it has created the complications because you have Ukraine, which had about three quarters of its uh, gas came from Russia, but Belarus, Lithuania, those countries all the way up to Finland. Uh, but even if you look at Hungary, you look at Slovakia, all those countries are vastly dependent uh, on Russia for uh, those energy sources. And this goes all the way over to uh, Germany, which is why there was some question about whether Germany would actually get on the bandwagon in criticizing and uh, going after sanctions uh, against uh, Russia, uh, Putin and the oligarchs. Uh, so it really is a, a larger issue uh, that has to be addressed uh, that I am very worried about, uh, in part because in the U.S., the country is so divided. Let me put it like that. The uh, within certain leadership structures in the U.S., uh, there are very, uh, we're very divided in terms of how much time, energy, and focus to put on addressing climate change and these environmental issues uh, versus the uh, essentially capitulation to uh, these uh, energy uh, monarchs uh, that have had undue political uh, and policy influence uh, for decades. This is where I lean on my experts who work on economics because this is not my wheelhouse. So <laughs> I'm gonna trust them. Um, but I was also thinking that just I have friends in Ukraine and in Russia, and I, I think what 
a lot of people don't understand is this is a fundamental shift in, in both Ukraine and Russia. What Ukraine and Russia were two and a half weeks ago is not what they are today and it's not what they will be in the future. And we are looking at uh, essentially a need for a Marshall Plan for both Ukraine and Russia after this. Um, because what, what we're seeing in Ukraine is massive physical destruction, but also it's going to have an economic impact. In Russia, when the ruble is you know close to nothing, Gazprom has nearly collapsed in terms of what it's worth. So that we will see a lot of reverberating um, impacts of this. But on top of that, I think that like as an American, like I'm, I'm from Texas, a few more pennies for gas, I think it is, it's a blessing that that's the only thing we have to worry about right now when cities are being leveled and hospitals are being bombed. And that's really what I do to keep, to keep it in perspective because we've all noticed prices going up. And very quickly, the follow-up question is, what is the effect for the Russian economy? Um, I'm sort of thinking back into, I went there in the mid nineties when it wasn't quite as bad as the early nineties, but still you were talking about rationing of sugar, um, rationing of all sorts of food, um, not easy access to supplies. So what is the economic effect, uh, not just in Russia, but on the garden variety Russian individual. And this is sort of lightning rounds that, um, being mindful of everybody's time, we can go ahead and do some closing comments. So um, anyone can start. I would say it's pretty brutal, more than brutal for the average Russian that they're paying the price for a narrow set of leaders within their country. Uh, there are pictures of Russians in long lines at ATMs to get cash there's not a lot of cash or any cash in some of these banks by the time they get a person in the line gets to the front. Uh, I think there's gonna be long-term implications of this. And one of the things that my team at USIP is watching is what forces could possibly develop in reaction to this. So we don't really know if there's a coup in Russia, if Putin dies somehow, what's going to emerge because it may return to that 90s environment of people shooting each other on the streets in this power competition. And so that's something to monitor. And I think that's an aspect to uh, track in terms of how this will play out in Russia and the painful implications for average Russians, for young people who can't go to other countries to get outside that bubble of Russia and all that state media and propaganda that's taken place to encounter different cultures, to meet with friends, and just thinking about the border situation uh, to build off what Kimberly said, is that you had so many connections between Russia and Ukraine in that border environment. You have mixed families. And so uh, in addition to the economic implications is that dynamic of families that are just facing destruction because of having this mix with Russia and Ukraine, friendships, networks, businesses are all being destroyed right now because of this war. Yeah, um, I remember how traumatic it was during the Soviet period um, when borders were very tightly closed um, and what a radical change it was in spite of the economic impact in the 90s when families that left during the Soviet period could finally reconnect with their families again. Um, it, it is really amazing to think that we might be going back to that level of personal effect. So. Uh, with that, it's 2.24, and I want to give the panelists time to do some closing observations and remarks. Uh, so I'm going to start with Kimberly, then Dr. Ashby, then Dr. Professor Lusain. Go ahead. Um, so one, thank you all for coming. And I think it's, it's good that I know in undergrad, it can be really hard to make time, but I appreciate you all making time to be here and to learn about Ukraine. But also, I think one of the most important things I would impress upon everyone is to remember that 
There are people who look like us in Ukraine who are in bomb shelters right now. There are people who look like us in Ukraine who don't have access to food right now. And so what we can do, the best we can do is to use this righteous anger that we hold and rightfully hold to try to channel our energy and resources into helping the people on the ground. Um, otherwise, you know, we're not, we're not being productive. So I think that's the best way to kind of work through this right now and to be very aware of where you get your information and to think critically about where you get your information. Yes, uh, to build off that is to definitely be careful where you're getting your information, what you're sharing, uh, and to look for reputable sources that have been outlined during this conversation for understanding the conflict and ongoing developments of what's taking place. I think for me and thinking about this environment is just how precious democracy is and I think many of us know on this panel, as well as the audience members know that the critical role people of color have served within the United States since its founding of holding up US democracy. And so there are so many challenges to our system right now. And that's also feeding externally what Russia is presenting, what other countries are challenging about the international system that's coming more forward with this conflict. It's just to keep fighting for our democratic system to get involved in any way that you can and what you feel comfortable with is political groups, organizations that are advocating for solidarity within the United States to support our democracy, but also with other nations such as Ukraine to realize that this fight is international and it's going to be a fight that's going to go on for a while. It's not just something that's right now, but it's for the future of how countries are able to stand on their own to support their self-determination, territorial integrity, free press, the ability to vote for your leaders. And so we need to offer support to them as well as the same time as to support our own democracy. Professor Lussain. Uh, yeah, first, uh, let me say I'm uh, very honored uh, and pleased to be on with uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Ashley uh, and Kimberly, uh, and for the just amazing work uh, and research that you guys are doing. Uh, it's, it's just indispensable. Uh, just a quick thing I would say on uh, in Russia, there's going to be a lot of pain. Uh, it's already manifesting. For me, the issue, though, is how would that pain be explained? Will it be blamed on Putin, which would be precarious to his rule, or will it be blamed on the capitalists of the West, Europe, and, and elsewhere, so that it deflects and it keeps an autocrat in power. Uh, unfortunately, this crisis is not going to end soon. Uh, it is well beyond just the military crisis, whatever may happen on the ground uh, in Ukraine. And, and again, hopefully we will get a ceasefire and the war will stop. And, and as Kimberly pointed out, uh, people's lives will not be uh, at risk. But as long as, as Putin is in power and his framing of how he sees uh, Eastern Europe, uh, there will continue to be a threat and continue to be uh, a danger. I think uh, for going forward, uh, one of the things that uh, we can do and people who are, who are on this is pay attention to what the United States is going to do. Uh, there are elements in uh, the United States that are absolutely aligned uh, with Putin, starting with the former ex-president uh, but there are others uh, in the far right and in the uh, far right media uh, who will uh, accelerate and amplify uh, the false information, disinformation that uh, Dr. Ashby and Kimberly uh, have been talking about. So uh, pay attention, uh, absolutely uh, try to stay on top of what's going on, but also be very wary of uh, this information that a lot of the disinformation uh, that's out there. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Fabrice, for uh, your initiating and, and bringing off this uh, forum. Well, the Mecca is a uniquely positioned place for providing insight into this. And I just want to turn again to Tanya Hope of the Bunch Center to go ahead and sort of close us up and uh, do the shout out to the Bunch Center. 
No, thank you all so much. Um, I'm sorry that my connection is bad. I'm going to have to go back and look for the recording. So um, once we do have the recording, we will be sure to put it certainly on the Bunch Center's YouTube channel. Um, and probably, I don't know if the political science department has one, but in any case, you can follow us on our social media and you'll be able to access the recording in case anything was interrupted on your end. Um, but I really, really and truly thank all of you for your insight, um, for providing this context, for giving us a much broader perspective on what the situation is uh, in, in Ukraine. Um, and I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking we might need to have a part two of this because I'm curious about um, so many other things, uh, like what happens when the uh, people of African descent who are leaving Ukraine, when they get to Poland and Romania and these NATO countries, I think that might be a part two because I know that there are other issues on the ground in that sense. So maybe, maybe you covered it while I was disconnected, but And, um, oh, there, you're back. They're not trying to let me be great here and I don't appreciate it. And so <laughs> it is, anyway, I'm, before this gets cut off again, I just want to say thank you all for participating. Thanks to everyone who, um, who joined us and, and, and be on the lookout for the recording. <laughs>